application of what we've been doing. But this is the major topic that I want to try and get through this morning. Um, standing waves, stationary waves, you'll see them referred to equivalently in different textbooks by those terms. They mean the same thing. Um, we've been talking about waves carrying energy, remember, uh, up to this point, which remains true, but there is a mechanism uh, a phenomenon by which we can localize that energy in space. Right now, again, much as I hinted at yesterday, you're going to come back to this at a much, much deeper level when you start looking at, in the context of this, for instance, the behavior of electrons, electron energy levels uh, in materials. Uh, we'll use the whole standing wave uh, mechanism for describing those energy levels. If I've got time, I'll show you one of the slides from my stage three um, solid state physics course where this stuff comes in. Uh, and it comes in elsewhere as well. But it's at its base, it's straightforward. It is just an application of the principle of superposition. It is just one wave passing through another wave and adding up. All right? But if the circumstances are just right, then we get this thing called a standing wave uh, generated. So what have we got? Let's imagine uh, you know, a string attached to a hook on the wall and we're just causing vibrations to travel along it. Uh, we're setting up waves in this string. Right? You'll never get this to work in practice, okay? Believe me, I've tried. Um, you can do it mechanically, but actually trying to get your hand to go perfectly up and down and not adopt some elliptical motion is almost impossible. Um, but anyway, our wave's travelling in towards this fixed point on the wall and then it gets reflected back again. Uh, if it's going to get reflected back, actually what comes in as uh, a peak will come back as a trough. It right? gets flipped upside down in the reflection. So now we've got actually two waves. We've got the wave that originally went towards our fixed point and we've got the reflection coming back in the opposite direction. And these will superpose one on the other. They're just two waves that happen to be travelling in opposite directions. This is drawn in a very uh, simplified schematic way, I suppose. We're assuming that there is no loss of amplitude. Uh, we're also, of course, able now, because one is just the reflection of the other, to say that they must have the same frequency, right, the same wavelength. So that keeps it easy. Now, you can see immediately that if, in, at this moment of time, where we've captured this process in play, uh, if we superpose these two waves, we'd end up with what? Yeah we'd have no displacement at all because they're completely out of phase. Right? Um, excuse me. But a little bit later on, you can fairly easily imagine uh, this wave crest would have moved a little bit in that direction, that trough would have moved a little bit in that direction. We won't be getting destructive interference anymore. We'll be getting something in between. And in fact, if we wait long enough, we're going to get constructive interference happening. We'd actually have uh, a peak up here, co or peak wherever it is, coinciding with another peak down here. All right? This one's, this one, let's just take this one. It's going to move enough that way to coincide with another peak coming out in that direction. So we're going to go from destructive interference to constructive interference at a given point, given distance, depending on time. Now the neat thing with the standing wave is that there are going to be points, it turns out, if we get it right, along this <coughs> axis that will never have any displacement at all. They will always be sat at the equilibrium position and those are called nodes. Now I'm going to show you a lot of pictures and, and a cartoon later on to try and illustrate this, uh, which might bring it out a little bit better. Uh, and it's those nodes that are going to enable us to characterize our um, standing waves. So as I say, this is a totally unrealistic experiment, uh, but it's a, it's a sort of diagram of something I will try with a mechanical system on the bench 
uh, to demonstrate to you. I'll try and get this set up for next week because it's quite nice to see this in, in play. But here's the process at different moments in time. All right, so we're going through a complete cycle down here. This is one time period, one complete cycle. So if we start the clock at zero, we've got our incoming wave, our reflected wave. At this point in time, they are in phase, so we get constructive interference. So what we observe is this thing down here. Right? It's got twice the amplitude, essentially, assuming these two are the same, which they are. If we move a quarter of a cycle later on, in other words, this wave has moved a quarter of a wavelength that way, this one's moved a quarter of a wavelength that way, so in total they're displaced from one another by half a wavelength, half a cycle, they're now totally out of phase, which means that we're going to get destructive interference. Yeah? Another quarter of a cycle further on again, both have moved by another quarter of a wavelength, so half a wavelength in total. We've now moved by an entire uh, uh, set, as it were. We've got constructive interference again, and so here we get this constructive interference pattern. But note that that pattern is out of phase with that one. Where there's a negative here, we've got a positive here, and vice versa. Another quarter cycle, destructive interference, <coughs> and a complete cycle, surprise, surprise, as it jolly well should be, we're exactly where we started. Right? That's what makes it a cycle. We've gone through one complete uh, oscillation. Now this um, cartoon of that process, uh, hopefully, you'll find useful. This is the pulse we looked at yesterday. Um, and here's our standing wave pattern. Right, now we've just taken one of these as stationary and the other one. Nope, sorry, that's not. That's our superposition, which I did show you. So here's the standing wave. So a wave moving in one direction, a wave moving in the other. They've got the same amplitude, same frequency. All right? And all we're doing at any moment in time is adding the displacement of one wave to the displacement of the other, and the bold curve at the bottom is giving us the result. That's all that's happening. So there are points you can see on this curve, here's one of them, with this label with this dot here, which never, ever, ever move. And that is a node. All right? Now, surprise, surprise, those parts on this wave that move the most, so, you know, here's one, all right? it goes maximum negative to maximum positive, that's going to be called an anti-node. But it's the nodes that are the ones we'll, we'll focus on most. So here's another anti-node over here labelled. All right, so this is a standing wave. It's definitely a wave. Still a sinusoidal wave. But the wave crests, you'll notice, are not moving in space. They are quite literally stationary. Even though it's composed of two progressive waves that are moving in space. Yeah? Everyone get what's happening here? So we've got things that are moving, giving rise to a distribution of energy, which is essentially what that's showing us in the bottom there, that is stationary in space. And that's what's called a stationary wave. Okay, let's get rid of this. Go back to where we were. This is essentially the demonstration that I'm going to try and show you. Uh, it works quite well. Um, it's a, here's our fixed point. Right? It's essentially a pulley wheel with, with some weights hung off the end just to give us some tension in the, in the string. Uh, nothing more remarkable than that. Uh, and then very small oscillations, so it's just an eccentric camshaft rotating at the other end just to waggle the string a little bit. Uh, we can set up our, uh, our oscillations in the string. And if we get it right, um, what I mean by getting it right is that we've got that length right, uh, actually changing the weight also, changing the tension in the string also has an effect. Um, but what we can do is set up a standing wave such that we end up observing this shape here. <coughs> Now, this is the result of applying the principle of superposition. 
So we've still got waves starting here, moving up to this point and being reflected back again. We're still talking about two progressive waves passing through each other. All this is showing us is the result of the principle of superposition in action. So what we observe, uh, you know, if I can try and do it, uh, it's much better with the kit. But basically all we're going to observe is that okay, happening. And that's what this diagram is trying to show. So we've got two nodes, either end of the string in this case, uh, and the antinode is therefore in the middle. And that's called the fundamental uh, of this standing wave. If we uh, change the condition suitably, so we can either change the length of the string, or in fact what I will do, because it's much, much easier, is change the tension in the string, uh, which gives us the same effect visually, um, we'll get a wave pattern that looks like that. So now we've got a node at either end and another node in the middle. And each of those nodes is separated, obviously, by an antinode. So the string will just oscillate between maximum positive and negative amplitude here and here. And you'll notice this one, uh, whatever moment of time we're at, this antinode is going to be out of phase with that antinode. And that will always be the case. Step to the next antinode along in your piece of string, and it will always be out of phase. Um, change the setup again, so again, change the length of the string, change the tension in the string, either way, uh, we'll end up with, again, a standing wave pattern. Now in between these, and before we've got to this one, the fundamental, we've got all sorts of stuff happening. It's still the principle of superposition in play, but what we haven't got until we get the conditions just right is a standing wave. We've just got a wave going in this direction, a wave going in that direction. They're adding up at all the points along the piece of string and giving us something, whatever that something might be. But it's not a stationary wave. It is not such that the nodes are fixed in position, right? which is what a standing wave is. So we've not localised the energy, in other words, in space. Right? Now, you see why this is going to be useful when we start talking about electron energy nodes. A really useful way of describing a system where energy is localized in space, but we need to be talking in terms of waves. So actually we talk about electrons trapped in a potential well, and all that means is they're trapped in uh, you know all the positive, if we think about a metal, all the positive ions in our metal are actually creating uh, traps for our electrons essentially. They're all just attracted to these positive ions. So we just talk about uh, the electron wave function as it were being reflected between the walls, between the positive ions, in other words, in this system. And we end up with stationary waves, which we can use to describe the energy levels. Anyway, that's digressing. So in terms of nomenclature, this is our fundamental, so this is the very first standing wave pattern that we generate. Uh, first overtone, second overtone, third, fourth, fifth, and so on, and a series beyond that. Right. Um, the next slides are basically just repeating and unpacking uh, what I've said so far. There's nothing genuinely new coming up now for a little while. Um, this is, again, this is essentially what I've said before. So here at one point uh, in time, one moment in time, we've got uh, constructive interference reinforcement going on. So we'd ob observe this sort of pattern. You'll notice here we've got one, two, three, four, five uh, nodes in this particular pattern. A half a cycle later of our standing wave, that is, um, we've got uh, no displacement at all. But the waves giving rise to that are still there. We've still got these two waves travelling past each other in space. They don't disappear. They just superpose to create what we observe. What we observe in this case 
is actually zero displacement, even though at different points along this, uh, this curve our two waves actually have, um, uh, definitely have non-zero displacement. Alright, so again, this is, this is saying in, in text exactly what I've said uh, before. Um, and again, this is not going to surprise you because it's exactly the same statement as I made about nodes. Distance between one node and the other must be half a wavelength of our standing wave. It stands to reason it's got to be the same then for nodes because they're equally equally spaced. So if we look at the fundamental, right, it is half a wavelength of our standing wave. Yeah? It's just this bit. We haven't yet got that bit. So it's half a cycle. Which means our fundamental's wavelength must be twice whatever the length of our piece of string is. Okay, so there's our fundamental wavelength. If that's our wave speed, then we can now write an expression down for the fundamental frequency. It's just the wave speed divided by the fundamental uh, wavelength. So our waves, uh, our frequency, therefore, is the wave speed divided by twice the length of the piece of string in this case. Um, if we go up to the first overtone. Uh, the frequency for our first overtone, if you go through the process, right, this is a complete wavelength now, it's just twice whatever the fundamental frequency was. And the second overtone is three times the fundamental frequency, and so on and so on and so on. Okay, same stuff all over again. The reason I'm putting this down in as many ways as I could think of putting it down is that this is a crucially important topic. I've tried to illustrate it with respect to this stage three stuff about electron energy levels, just to paint a picture for you of the fact that this is really going to become uh, quite important throughout. So it's it's a good idea to keep it uh, keep it really to the forefront of your thinking uh, in that sense and get to grips with it. So as I say, there's nothing on this slide that says anything that I haven't actually said to you already. Um, it is just discussing again how the two waves go through each other and produce um, produce our standing wave pattern. So, what can we draw out of this in terms of general statements? Well, um, if we take two nodes next to each other, all the points in our standing wave that are um, uh, displaced between them are going to be in phase of one another. Right? So if go back to my crude demonstration of the fundamental, right? So that my wrists are supposed to be the nodes. We've got that going on between them. Right? So all the motion in between those two nodes is in phase, right? Everything is going up at the same time, everything is going down at the same time. They're in phase. But if you move to the next block along then everything is out of phase, right? When the first one is moving up, everything in the second one is moving down. So if you go to the next but one node, in other words, uh, that's going to be the case. So that's our second uh, bullet point up there. So we can, we can calculate whether we're going to be in phase or out of phase relatively easily. We've just got to count nodes, basically. So out to the first node from wherever we take as our original one, everything's in phase, out to the next one, it's out of phase, back in phase again, out of phase, in phase, and so on. So all we've got to do is count the number of nodes between any two points on the wave, uh, and we can tell whether they're going to be in phase or out of phase with one another. So, standing waves. Um, You've all heard them. They get built up in concert halls all the time. Just go into the cathedral and listen to some music. Some fantastic standing waves get set up in there. Um, um, you remember this is about six slides before we ended last week. So we've done stationary waves. 
which I explained to you are a fairly important topic in the sense that they're going to recur in one form or another throughout your, your time here. But I did promise that I would try <coughs> and produce a visual demonstration of how that works. Now, I've in past years had mixed success with this. Um, there is always a danger when you try and do live demonstrations uh, in a lecture that it will go horribly wrong. <coughs> uh, but, you know, you have the advantage that the only person who's going to look foolish is me and not you. Um, but anyway, this kit is really, really simple, but it should help demonstrate um, the sort of stuff that, um, that I tried to describe, you know, in terms of words and slides uh, last week. Um, so here's the setup. There's a little eccentric cam here. So this isn't quite a node, but it's sort of close to it. It's just a very small uh, amplitude uh, being put in at that end. This is our fixed point. Uh, and those of you who were there will remember that I said we can either change how the vibrations are going to behave on this piece of string by changing its length, and that actually was the process we went through in the slides, uh, or actually I can change the tension in the string and it will do the same thing. You're, you know, when you come to do these experiments in practice, you'll, um, you know, you'll be able to demonstrate that to yourself, and that's essentially what this is. I mean, there's a spring balance on there for doing this properly. I will not be using it because I'm not going to be doing it properly. I'm just going to try and demonstrate, you know, that it works. Okay? So my aim is at least to get the fundamental and a couple of overtones, but we'll see. It requires a relatively steady hand. Um, so all that's going to happen, remember, is that we're going to start some vibrations going at this end, where the eccentric cam is. They're going to travel along the string. All right? This is just a static point. It's a pulley wheel. That's all it is. Uh, so they'll be reflected back again. So now we're going to have a wave going that way and its reflection going that way. Right? <coughs> Constant phase relationship, they will, you know, it, well, sorry, if there is a constant phase relationship, we're going to interfere in the pattern. But anyway, they will superpose. So what we will see in terms of the displacement at any point along this piece of string is simply the addition of whatever the um, displacement is for the wave going that way and the displacement for the wave going the other way. All right. um, now it's a little bit noisy when I turn it on but not terribly so and all that's, all that's happening is that this eccentric cam is going to ro uh, rotate. Right. So, if I, oh look at that, wow, second overtake straight off. Um, this is obviously not set up as best it could be. There, next one. So now we've got node, 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 and then anti nodes in the middle. Right? So it's a wave that is stationary in space. It's definitely a wave, it's a repeated sinusoidal motion. Right? This bit of string is just right, moving from one side to another. Yes, no. Close. But not yet the cigar. There we are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight notes roughly. So not bad. So let's see how low we can go. So we've been through that one. We've done that one. One, that's a fairly strong one. There we are, first over time. Alright, this is just the superposition of two waves. There's nothing else going on here. So, can we get the fundamental? Not without jury rigging this over there. So, let's forget that altogether. Excuse me, why? Well, Move that back into position. Oh, fundamental. It's way beyond the limit of this spring balance, but uh, we've got the fundamental. So all that's happening, as I say, is just one wave passing through another and adding up. 
but we have an energy distribution now that's located in space. All right, so as I said, in stage three, you're going to talk about electron energy levels using this sort of terminology. All right, so there's its fundamental. Whoa, and if we put in a bit more energy, we go to first overtime. Can I do this in a controlled enough way? Smackening it off is actually more difficult than adding tension. No, skip on. There we are, there's the next energy level. And so on and so forth. Yeah? Good. Wrecked it. That's a very good way of returning the equipment to the lab technicians. I will get a lot of help in the future if I do that. Um, right, bear with me. See, it's my day. It's gonna be my day. I'll do it afterwards. Right.